welcome to our program for tonight and welcome to those of you who are watching this via Zoom. Happy to have all of you join us tonight for a really interesting program, I think. Um, we have coming up next Wednesday, which I think is the 12th, at a little bit earlier time, 6 p.m., so you note that, uh, Lizzie Borden and the Borden Murders. And the presenter is billing it as the original CSI. So I don't know if this blood splatter or what, I don't know. But um, he has uh, a lot of information about the family and about the murders. And um, even though Lizzie was tried, she was acquitted for the murder of her parents. So it is an unsolved mystery that maybe we can figure out. So come, come on back for ex-murderers <laughs> next week. Um, and oh, our movie this month is on the 18th, uh, Tuesday at 2 p.m. It is The Woman uh, King, starring Viola Davis. She's good in everything, so probably be a good movie. I don't know a lot about it. <clears throat> but tonight, we have something that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. Art Hidden in Plain Sight, uh, the magnificent uh, rock carvings along Lake Michigan. Um, I hadn't ever really heard about them, which I guess is the point, because they're, um, the, most people don't know about them, and they're mostly uh, anonymous carvings. We don't know who did most of them. And they run the gamut from very small little characters to big mythological uh, scenes and, and portraits. Um, the fact that they've been there, like some go back as far as 100 years, is pretty amazing. Uh, the fact that they've been there and we really don't know much about them uh, is amazing to me. But tonight, we will resolve all that because Bill Swislow is going to show us and tell us about these carvings. So please welcome Bill Swislow. Thank you and thanks to everyone. Uh, in person and online who uh, are gonna uh, hear me unlock some of the mysteries of these carvings. Um, I like to think of the Chicago Lakefront as a virtual museum of art that hardly anyone knows about. You know, and if they've noticed these sculptures along the lakefront, most people have no idea where the art came from. And in many cases that is still true, but I will unlock some of the mysteries. So. Much of Chicago's lakefront is lined with these limestone blocks. They were put in place about 100 years ago to protect the shoreline. Um, and they run, they, they start at the Indiana state, state Line, and with a number of interruptions, they run all the way up to uh, Hollywood Avenue, which is about 22 miles. Um, so because they were limestone, limestone is soft enough to carve but hard enough that the carvings survive a long time, even under dire conditions. So of course, the lakefront of Chicago is a place where millions of people, you know, swim, hang out, fish, um, go there to drink, whatever, whatever you would do in a, in, 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 in a park along the lake. This photo is from the 1950s in Hyde Park. Um, this is actually just a little north of there. Um, and if you can see it, this is the 59th Street Beach, but that rock there, there's another view of it, has all these names carved into it, probably about 20 names. So Mike and, and Chris and Ed. Um, so this is where a place where sort of ordinary people left behind this trace of their own identity. And in my opinion, my argument is that they sort of created spontaneously this collective monument to life at the lake. Um, sort of, so it's a spontaneous social history of the millions of people who spent time by the lakefront. Now, you know, these are kind of petroglyph. Most of us, when we think about petroglyphs, think about something like this. Um, the petroglyphs of the American Southwest, or in this case, these are from Hawaii, the Big Island. Um, there's other kinds of carvings you may stumble across uh, in weird places. So these are, are names carved into the rocks at um, Giant City State Park in Southern Illinois. They're just out in the woods, along a trail, um, 
people carved their names there starting in the 19th, in the mid, middle 1800s, um, up until the present day. Of course, today, it would be considered inappropriate to carve your name in a rock in basically a natural area. As we'll talk about, Chicago's shoreline is not natural, and in my opinion, uh, therefore, doesn't come under that exclusion. But this was just in the woods, um, lots of names of people, so again, leaving behind a bit of their identity. So here's an example of a similar phenomenon in Chicago. So the Chicago petroglyphs that we're going to talk about are all modern. Um, people started carving them around at least as far back as 1930, probably potentially a few years earlier, because the first limestone blocks were put in place around 1925 um, at Fullerton Avenue. This particular block is at Foster Avenue Beach. Um, there's actually a date on the bottom for those of you in, who can see that of, of 1961. There's about 60 names carved into this one rock at Foster Beach. So Otto and Doc and, and Vic and Mo and all these people um, kind of accumulated their names on this one rock. Now, as with most of these carvings, we don't know what these carvers intended, um, though we can guess. Again, it's sort of leaving behind your name, uh, and it's a way to sort of kill time. But when you put all these carvers worked together, to me, this rock itself represents a collective work of art. Um, I mean, it's not museum quality art, but it's a, it's a kind of art form. Um, and the rock is still there. It doesn't look as good. Actually, it looks a lot worse today than it did in this picture. Um, that's the result of weathering. But it, it's really a pretty stunning uh, uh, piece of sculpture that, you know, you, if you go to Foster Beach, you can see. As we'll see, there's a lot more to see at Foster Avenue Beach in Chicago. So this is sort of a map of the carvings, as I say, starting at Calumet Park Beach, which is right at the Indiana line all the way up really to Hollywood Avenue. There's a couple of carvings at Loyola Park, but it's really in this area. Um, what's, what's amazing to me is that and I, I've photographed, I've walked all of these sites, I've photographed every carving I could possibly find, and I've counted the number of carvings in the photos I've taken, and there are more than 6,000 carvings lining the Chicago shoreline from Calumet Park up to Foster Avenue. Uh, that's today. There used to be a lot more carvings, but many of them were destroyed as part of shoreline protection projects in the 2000s, which I'll talk about. Uh, more than half of these carvings are names and initials, what you would expect people hanging out, just hanging out, who are not artists, would, would <laughs> cut into the rocks. Um, but some of them are much more impressive whether they're animals or faces or figures, and we'll see a bunch of those. Um, the other thing I want to say is that this kind of, these modern carvings along a, a, a major urban shoreline, as far as I've been able to determine, are unique in the world. And I've looked because I wanted to find other places like, like this because I thought it'd be really nice to be able to sort of compare what people did, but there's nothing like this anywhere in the world. There are ancient carvings, so if you go to Sydney, Australia, there are ancient petroglyphs that are hundreds or thousands of years old scattered around Sydney. Um, you know, near Albuquerque, New Mexico, there are, again, very old car Native American carvings, but nothing like this where you have a modern urban shoreline lined with petroglyphs. Um, I haven't been able to find anything like it. The picture, by the way, is from Rainbow Beach, which is on the south side of Chicago, around 77th Street, looking towards north, towards downtown. There are just a ton of carvings at Rainbow Beach, and we'll talk more about Rainbow Beach. So one of the key messages that I want people, always want people to take away from this talk is that art can be found anywhere. Um, not just these carvings. You can see it driving down the road when you see a, an interesting, you know, usually vintage sign for a business. Um, you know, you can see it in graffiti, which is polarizing. Some of us love graffiti, and some of us don't care for it so much. But the point is, it can be found anywhere, not just in institutions of art. Um, and a lot of it is along the lakefront, like this very delicately carved mermaid, which is another one at Foster Avenue Beach. Um, the challenge with these rock carvings is it can be hard to see. So there's the mermaid there, and you can kind of, hopefully you can see there's her tail. She's kind of leaning back on her hand. <coughs> She's already quite weathered in this image. 
But if you're walking by, you wouldn't notice her there. Um, and in fact, even from when this photo was taken, which was about five years ago, she's become harder to see. She's weathered further. Uh, so the point is that most of these are hard to see, um, in some cases literally, in other cases because most people on the lakefront aren't looking down. You know, they're looking at their friends, they're looking out at the lake, they're looking at the park, so they don't see them. But if you look around, this is at Foster Avenue Beach, you might see this carving of Abe Lincoln, which is just, you know, sitting on top of a rock at Foster Beach. Um, if you look down, you might see a foot. This was someone carved this at Rainbow Beach. You might see a, a hand. This is at Foster Beach. This is about a foot and a half tall. It's a very large hand. Um, or you might see a lion. Um, I love this lion. This is at Foster Beach. A lot of these are at Foster Beach, because partly because that's where I live and I walk my dog there frequently. So well, very well documented. The interesting thing about the lion is it started out as a carving, but at some point, you just gonna need some water. At some point in the last 15 or 20 years, someone enhanced the lion. So they painted it and they gave the lion a body and a tail. Because that is in carved, the back half. What I love is they kind of gave the lion kind of a Jackson Pollock -y, you know, very, uh, you know, sort of splotchy body. But, you know, so you have a carving and then the rest of the lion. Usually I hate it when people paint over these carvings, but in this case it was arguably an enhancement. You know, you, sometimes you, you might come across something very impressive, although not this anymore because this has been destroyed. But this was a tribute to the moon landing at Montrose Harbor. And you can see how elaborate this was. There are the astronauts, the Earth, the moon, the flag, um, the date. And down in the corner it says Helmut, who was the carver, who carved a number of carvings at Montrose Harbor. Very elaborate. All of them have been destroyed and are lost, except in photos like this one, which was taken in the, early, in the late 1980s by my friend Aaron Packer. But you might see carvings that are still around, an interesting face. Um, this one is south, is north of uh, Montrose Harbor. It's often covered with sand. In fact, I believe it's covered with sand right now. This is actually a representation of the logo from Thor Heyerdahl's Kantiki expedition, if you remember that. Um, if, you, if you look at that logo for that, you'd see that's clearly what inspired this. This face is nearby. I like to think of this as John Malkovich, although <laughs> that's just my interpretation. Um, you might see a name. This is on the south side uh, in Hyde Park. You know, very nice typography by Bill Adler up there. And you'll see a lot of hearts. In this case, a double heart. You can kind of see the arrow on the upper right piercing that, that one heart and then going into the other heart. This is behind La Robita Hospital. And we'll look at these spots um, later on in the presentation. Sometimes there'll be snippets of stories. Some of these can be hard to read. But this one says, uh, David Walsh, survivor of Lake Geneva, 1967. I actually think it's a day, I think it's January 6th, 1967. So, you know, we don't know the rest of David Walsh's story. We just know he survived Lake Geneva. Or you might see something nastier like this, which is Mary Papilla is a junkie. Uh, these are both out at Rainbow Beach. Um, you know, you might see something like these. The top one, hard to read at this distance, but it says I loved and lost her, so kind of sad. And the bottom one says I still love Ma, so kind of happy. Also at Rainbow Beach. Or there may be messages we don't fully grasp. So this is at Foster Beach. So on the left you have the TV set that says Nixon and has a dollar sign. And for you young people, those are rabbit ear antennas. <coughs> You have the crosses of Calvary there, and then I don't think the original carver would have carved dead haha, -ha, so kind of a nasty commentary. And then you have a fish. So I call this the triptych. Um, you know, probably three different carvers. You know, what they mean together is anyone's speculation. This rock, by the way, is about eight feet wide. These are fairly substantial carvings. Now, I've talked a lot about Foster Beach, and just at the north end of the beach, there's 20 of these blocks. You can see most of them here, and they host more than 30 carvings. You know, there's the hand. Um, you know, there's this beautiful, what I call a bathing beauty carving. She's actually quite small, maybe six inches high, just sort of the seated 
figure, you know, you can see there's her bottom, her legs, her arms. Her, her, she looks like she's wearing a bathing cap. Um, you know, none of these were made for fame or, you know, they were just made anonymously. So this one it can be a little hard to interpret, but this is at, you know, again, at the same rocks at Foster Beach. On the upper left are two fish. The upper right is the one that's hardest to see, but that's a torso. Um, lower right is a squirrel eating a, an acorn. And then lower left, 1958. 1958, by the way, is when Foster Avenue Beach actually opened. It was created in the mid-1950s when Lakeshore Drive was extended north. So this is kind of the Foster Beach experience in a nutshell. All right, fish, swimming, squirrels, that, that's what it's all about at Foster Beach. But there's something else important about Foster Beach. Presumably we're all familiar with this hit from Greece. It'll go on for another minute. So here's the playwright for Greece, Jim Jacobs. So this is a picture of Jim Jacobs from 1960. Hanging out, if you remember that big hand, I'm pretty sure he's just below where that hand is. Um, he looks pretty cool. I don't think he looks that cool anymore. He's still alive. But, but he wrote Greece, but you may or may not know that Greece was originally set in Chicago. And it's about students from, I believe, Taft High School. And a key scene in Greece, the original Greece, took place at Foster Beach, such that there was a song called Foster Beach in the original play. That song is the song that evolved to become Summer Nights. And in that song, there were lyrics, and the lyrics were, he painted on the rocks a summer souvenir on Foster, Foster Beach. Now, <coughs> this one says Pat and Jim, I have no, and it's a carving, not a painting, and I have no way of knowing that it was our Jim, the playwright. But it is sort of interesting that right when those carvings were being made, like that 1961 rock with all the names, would have been around when Jim Jacobs and his buddies and, and his girlfriends were hanging out at Foster Beach. So I like to think that that um, maybe some of the original Greece people, those names might be on that rock. Speculation, I know. Um, there are other love stories, actual true life love stories along the lake. So this says Kathy and Buzz. Um, Buzz is actually Buzz and Garo. And this says, 1963-456-78. So I was able to track Buzz down. Most of the, the vast majority of these carvings are absolutely anonymous, but Buzz had an, had an unusual enough name that I was able to track him down through the Rotary Club of Goshen, New York. I, I got Buzz on the phone, which was really great, because Buzz explained that he was, he had been a, this was at Rainbow Beach, that he had been a lifeguard at Rainbow Beach the 1960s, that the lifeguards there would, would had a hammer and chisel they would pass around and they would carve their names into the rocks. And these years are the years he worked there. So he started in 1963 and every year he would add a number. And having spent a lot of time at Rainbow Beach, there's a lot of these, um, the, the years with the hyphens. So what was great about Buzz though is that when I talked to him on the phone, he said, and by the way, there he is again, another carving with the same years. And there's the carving of Buzz and Kathy. Um, he said, and Kathy is in the room with me. So Buzz and Kathy still together <laughs> since the 1960s. Sim, you know, a similar story is at Promontory Point at Hyde Park. So this says Linda Turner, Bob Nactree of 64. So again, Bob Nactree, unusual name. I was able to track him down through a local preservation group in Joliet where he lives and he told me that in the spring of 1964 he and his friend Cliff Weaver were freshmen at the U of C. You know, just wanted to get away so they got up very very early one morning, took hammers and chisels belonging to Bob's father, went out to Promontory Point which is, if, you, if you don't know where it is, it's right across Lakeshore Drive from the Museum of Science and Industry and they carved their names and their girlfriend's names into the rocks. Bob said he never brought his, never brought Linda out there. He was kind of embarrassed about it, thought it looked amateurish. Um, 
And then his friend Cliff Weaver nearby was Cliff Weaver down in Florence, 1964. Both of them, at least as of a couple of years ago, were still alive and still married to the girls <laughs> whose names they carved into the rocks. Um, Bob ended up in the Foreign Service, lives in, retired, lives in Joliet. Cliff was actually a very prominent uh, zoning attorney in Chicago, and I was able to discover he had a Chianti winery in Italy that he bought. So he did very well. But he's the one who told me that Bob was really embarrassed by the workmanship. <laughs> um, so it goes. So other stories uh, of artists that I was able to track down. This is Guy Lazaro. Um, when I first saw this, I thought that was the year he carved it, but it's actually his birthday. And he was a steel worker in the 1950s. He went to Rainbow Beach to just get away from work. And he just decided one day to carve his name and to carve this self-portrait into the rocks. Um, he said, I did that without a picture. I was just, I measure with fingers, he said. He was just doing it his own thing. He said no one was paying attention while I was doing it. Um, so he's someone, whoops who didn't consider himself an artist. This was just something he wanted to do. So he carved the self-portrait. Unfortunately, he told me it was vandalized um, shortly after he carved it. So you can kind of see it speeding up, but you can still see a profile of a, of a youngish man um, in the rocks there at Rainbow Beach. Um, while we're at Rainbow Beach, this is just one of my favorite carvings. I actually use this as my Zoom virtual background. So you have this goofball sort of clown face NG and then over in the rock on the right, there's a tiny little skull. I mean, that skull is just a few inches high that someone carved over there. Um, you can see there's traces of other carvings all over, which is quite common, particularly at Rainbow Beach. Um, now, none of these carvers, even the ones I was able to identify, ever got any recognition, at least until I found them and have written about them. This is the one exception, is the, the, the people who carved this mermaid which was originally right on the lake, but was moved in the 2000s, and now resides at Oakwood Beach, which is a, at about 45th Street. So it's a mermaid carved out of one of these giant limestone blocks. Um, and the lead carver on this was an artist named Roman Villarreal, who, who was a former steel worker, but a self-taught stone carver. Um, and in 1986, with three friends, he carved this mermaid um, at 39th Street. Um, as I say, it's been moved. There's a close-up. So one of his friends was an accomplished stone carver from Mexico, and then a couple of helpers. So between Roman and Jose Moreno, they had, I think that was the name, they had two pretty accomplished stone carvers, which you can see. So in 2000, on the left, you see the Sun-Times did a story about this mystery mermaid, and no one could tell them where it came from, um, who did it. But Roman's daughter saw the story in the Sun-Times, contacted them and said, well, I was the model for the mermaid, and my dad carved it. And so the Sun-Times did a follow-up story about Roman, and up there you can see them actually working on the carving. What's really great is that Roman is still alive, uh, still very active. He's actually done a lot of commissions for the Park District, Chicago Park District. So he has carvings all over Chicago. Um, He's extremely active in the South Shore community, like community arts programs and, and whatnot. Um, at, at my museum, where I've been active for a long time, called Intuit, which is a museum of outsider and self-taught art, we actually had his first museum retrospective uh, um, through most of last year. Um, so there's Roman in his workshop. Uh, the mermaid is now on its side. Over the, 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 south, the winter of 2021, the wave action and the freezing thawing, and it's not clear exactly how it happened, tipped the mermaid over. Um, fortunately, it tipped it over on the, on the undecorated side, so you can still get a pretty good appreciation of the mermaid. You know, someday, hopefully, it'll be tipped back on its uh, proper side. And Roman, as I say, is still working. Um, last year, in May and October, he actually had carving workshops at Promontory Point, where he brought his tools and anyone could use his tools and do carvings. And so there are about 20 new carvings, including some by Roman, in the rocks at Promontory Point. There's what Roman carved, save the point, which I'll cut back to, and then a, a portrait of a woman. Um, so Roman is Mexican-American. These carvings were almost certainly, that I'm gonna show, made by a Mexican-American. 
This is the largest group of carvings by one person that I found. There are a dozen carvings by the same artist around Foster Beach. Um, this is an example of one of them. It's sort of easy to read. You can see the, the skull breathing the fire, it appears. Um, what I found out much later from uh, giving a walking tour of the carvings at Foster Beach from a neighbor who was on the tour is that most of these, and probably all these carvings are based on Mayan originals. So you can see that and you can see the similarity. This carving is a detail from the great ball court at Chichen Itza. Um, you know, his carving is somewhat simplified, but still pretty elaborate. You know, another example, and it shows that his carvings, these carvings at Foster Peaks, like the one on top, are very detailed, can be very hard to read, even when you're close up, let alone at, at a distance. Um, but this one was based on a Maya bird deity from the tablet of the foliated cross at Palenque in Mexico. Um, there, and, and it's actually a very small part of a much larger carving, but our guy didn't have the room to do the whole thing, so he just did the very top. You know, another example is this one. If you look in the middle, you can see there's a face, and it has feathers coming out on either side. There's the face, and this is also from the Great Ball Court of Chichen Itza, and again, it's a small part, and you can see at the bottom of the drawing of a much larger carving. So these are wonderful carvings. Um, they're, they're not weathering that well, but um, they're all still there around Foster Beach. And there are lots of other, those are mythological symbols, there's lots of other symbols up and down the lakefront. Here you have Big D, but you have the male-female symbols. This is at Morgan Shoal, which is in Hyde Park. You know, this, this very nicely carved peace sign, which is at Fullerton Avenue in the lake. It's probably the nicest peace sign along the lake. One thing I like to say when I show these peace symbols is there are a lot more peace symbols. There are swastikas, but there are a lot more peace symbols than there are swastikas, which I take as a positive. Um, at Fullerton Avenue in the lake, there's a number of carvings that were, were saved when the park there was expanded. So if you've ever been at Theater on the Lake, this is, these are in, right just south of Theater on the Lake. So you have these Egyptian symbols, the Ankh, the Eye of Horus, and I forgot the, the name of the bird de deity. Um, you also have what, what we call the hair washers, which are, um, you know, they look like they're, they're from the 1920s, which is quite possible. Um, all these carvings we just saw used to be right on the lake, but when the park was expanded in 2015 and 2016, um, they were the, 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 all these, they're called revetments that line, these limestone structures were ripped out. And the landscape architect for this park expansion asked that they save as many carvings as they could, and then she repurposed them around this new parkland. So this is part of a seating area. You can see the, this beautiful seating area, and you can see the hair washers are at the sort of lower left. The peace sign is off screen to the right, and there are some uh, Easter Island looking figures off screen to the left. Now, the key thing that to, to, to spend a little time on, is a little bit of history here, is the reason why these carvings exist here, and one reason why they don't exist anywhere else is what really Chicago's great, what I would argue is Chicago's greatest cultural achievement, which is that the, our lakefront was preserved free from industrial and commercial use. Um, nearly all of it. And, and what was given over to industrial use in, in the steel mills on the South Shore is now parkland as well. So except for a couple of miles at the north and, and, and so, southerly ends of the, of the shoreline where you have private high rises that go right up to the lakefront. Almost all of Chicago's lakefront is parkland. And it didn't just happen by coincidence. Um, there are reasons why it's parkland. Part of it is because both state and federal officials in the 1800s declared the lakefront off limits to building. Um, this is a sort of a famous map of Chicago that was created in, eight, in the, eight, I believe, 1836, when the state of Illinois sent commissioners to Chicago to kind of lay it out. And you can see on the bottom it says public, it says downtown, public ground, a common to remain forever open, clear, and free of any buildings or other obstructions 
whatever. Um, but again, that didn't, you know, that, that in itself wouldn't have had enough force to keep the lakefront from being developed and commercialized and industrialized, which in most cities that have waterfronts, that's what happened in the 1800s, uh, which is again why Chicago is unique, is unlike most cities you would go to, Chicago's waterfront was not industrialized. And why was that? What I like to call the four R's, which can get pretty obscure, but the, R, the four R's are the river, the railroad, retail and riparian rights. So briefly, um, the river became Chicago's harbor. Um, and it was an inadequate harbor, but it was the only harbor that Chicago had in the 1800s. Um, the railroad comes in because the Illinois Central Railroad ran right along the lakefront up to the Chicago River. The Illinois Central Railroad tried for decades to build a harbor on the lake and industrialize the lakefront. But because it was so hated and disliked, the railroads of those days were sort of like, I don't know, oil companies today or, or you know, increasingly big tech today. No one liked the railroads. No one wanted to give them a break. And so there was years of litigation and corruption and bribery but in the end, the Illinois Central Railroad did not get the right to build a harbor. So the lakefront remained unindustrialized from that point of view. Retail comes in because Montgomery Ward, who invented catalog retailing, had an office on Michigan Avenue that overlooked the lake. And he didn't want anything built between to obstruct his view. So anytime any construction was proposed for the Grant Park area, it, with the one exception of the Art Institute, Ward would go to court and litigate, and usually he won based on, you know, the, the, these earlier, um, uh, like this map. Um, and others litigated too, it wasn't just Montgomery Ward, to, to prevent any construction along the lakefront. And finally, riparian rights has to do with the right of the owners who live along any water course and what rights they have over the, the, the land under the water at the shoreline versus the rights of the state. And because it's so complicated that the years of litigation made it very hard for anyone to build anything along the lakefront because of the, and, and there's a whole book that was written a couple year, years ago about this exact issue, um, the rights of the waterfront. Um, if you really want to drill into it, it's a great book called The Public Trust Doctrine. Um, but so the result of all this confusion and litigation is that nothing effectively was built along the lakefront and the only people who were able to build with some freedom although the park districts districts plural and then consolidated into one district had to do a lot of wheeling dealing were the parks they were able to build along the lakefront and so they built parks all the way along the lakefront wherever they could so that that's the history of that part of it the other history is that um and you may recall the, the, the stories from the last few years, particularly 2020, 2021, about all the flooding and, and all the problems along the lakefront. Well, the, the, the Chicago lakefront, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier, is almost entirely artificial. It's mostly landfill. What isn't landfill is heavily engineered. And I like to say the lake doesn't like that. It has been trying to reclaim all this land for a long time. So this one is from 1901. Chicago's fight against Lake Michigan's restless waves. Um, you know, 1920, oh, 1917, you know, lakefront, you know, torn apart by storms. You know, 1929, another storm, another flood, more destruction along the lakefront. And then 2020, same story. Um, it goes back a long way. But someone around in the early 1920s had this idea that rather than doing like concrete decks along the lakefront, which is what they had basically been doing, you know, let's, let's do limestone. Let's build these limestone step stones going down to the lake. Limestone, you know, th these are gonna be hard for the lake to, um, to eliminate. Um, although it turns out that they didn't last forever anyways. So this is one of these revetments, they're called, being constructed. Um, the limestone, by the way, came from around Bloomington, Indiana, 
If you've ever seen uh, Breaking Away, the bicycle movie from the 70s that was sort of set in one of these quarries. These were the same quarries that supplied high quality limestone for like the Empire State Building and lots of major buildings. Chicago bought the limestone blocks that were defective, that weren't good enough for architectural use and hauled them up here um, and used them to build these revetments. The problem though was when they did this in the 20s, 30s, um, the foundations were actually wooden, which was fine as long as the wood was covered by the water, but when the lake levels fell, as we know now, we're very aware lake levels rise and fall, and the wood was exposed to water, the wood, to air I mean, the wood started to rot. And so a lot of these foundations, starting in the 1950s and 60s, started failing. And, and these limestone blocks, and the, I'll show some pictures, you can see it started tumbling into the water. Um, so in the 2000s, after years of trying to get this project going, um, a project was funded to do better shoreline protection, led by the Army Corps of Engineers. Now the Army Corps really only cares about flooding and erosion. The city actually had to step in in the 1980s and say, we're going to provide extra money so that rather than just dumping rubble along the Chicago lakefront, which was the original plan, you'll actually continue to have access to the lake. Unfortunately, the access to the lake that they decided on was to remove all the limestone and replace it with concrete and steel. So this is an area, this is known as the Belmont Rocks. Um, this was a major, major area for the gay community, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But you can also see at the edge that the, this was highly decayed. And so that's what they did. They basically ripped up the, the, the rocks, the limestone, and replaced it with concrete and steel like that, which looks very clean, but it's not nearly as inviting as these were. And that whole gay scene at Belmont Rocks vanished after they tore it out and replaced it with concrete. You can see at the top of this concrete and steel, they actually saved about 200 of these blocks and they run along the top of it. Um, and if you walk along there, there's some beautiful carvings, there's some beautiful paintings. One reason for that is that when they were doing this work, the, the alderman, uh, Tom Tunney, soon to be ex-alderman, walked this, this area of the Belmont Rocks with the project manager and said, I want you to save these rocks because of the paintings mainly, because there were lots of paintings uh, in addition to carvings like this one. So this was a very elaborate carving. It's still there, drink to me only with thine eyes, O solo mio. There's a flag on the lower right. There's this beautiful skull on top. Um, you know, the carvings are still there. That concrete deck is already deteriorating because the lake is brutal. Um, hopefully that will get fixed. This is what the Belmont Rocks looked like before 2003. You can kind of see on the left there's all that writing, that's an extract from a Walt Whitman poem, but there's writing and there's paintings all along the rocks, and most of that is gone. The paintings would disappear eventually anyways, because, you know, the paintings fade, but a lot of the carvings are gone too. There's an example of a painting that disappeared, more paintings that are no longer there. Um, but, you know, and I should say, this is mostly about carvings, but there are some interesting paintings that are still along the lakefront. This is almost at Hollywood Beach, or Kathy Osterman Beach. It's a tribute to rock stars, but not just rock stars, but guitarists. So it's Muddy Waters, Holland Wolf, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa, and Randy Rhodes, um, who was the guitarist in Twisted Sister. Um, this was done in 1999, but the artist has been there a couple times since and has refreshed it, because uh, it has, so it actually looks a lot better than it looks. And there are still people painting along the lakefront. This was painted in 2021. Um, this moon face was actually chalk. That same artist then painted another moon face. He, he did a whole bunch of these chalk moon faces, and eventually he painted that moon face. Unfortunately, the person I call the brown paint person, um, who was there to cover up gang graffiti, also covered up um, Tyler Anthony's beautiful moon face for no apparent reason. Uh, but that's my grievance. So, as I've said, the carvings have been there a long time. This is the oldest dated carving I found, June 
1930. This is in High Park at Morgan Shoal. Same low, very nearby, 62131. Um, so, you know, we're, we're nearing 100 years of uh, carvings along the Chicago lakefront. Um, so those carvings are both at Morgan Shoal, which is around 45th to 47th Street, 49th Street, 50th Street, uh, adjacent to Hyde Park. There's a shipwreck out there that's a, called the Wreck of the Silver Spray that a lot of divers go to. Um, there's beautiful carvings. There are hundreds of carvings at Morgan Shoal, like this seated bathing beauty. Um, this one's just an amazing carving, Flying Skull Frank. Uh, fairly recent carving. Unfortunately, Frank is now uh, buried by, again, wave action, push the big rock on top of Frank. You can find, see the curve of one of those rings, wings, just outside that shaded area there. Um, you know, someone carved a checkerboard. It was a playable checkerboard. Unfortunately, not playable anymore because it's fallen into the lake. Mm -hmm. This area around Morgan Shoal is highly deteriorated. You can see these are remnants of those revetments that are just falling, have fallen to pieces. Um, interestingly, though, people are still carving there. These were carved in 2021 because they weren't there in 2020. So there's a bee, a flower, and then you can see a little cat head there. Um, Morgan Shoal is threatened. The city, I mean, the city has a fully funded project to, to rebuild and expand. They're going to do landfill uh, because there's a lot of flooding right at this site. So they're going to push the park out into the lake, uh, push the bike path away from lake, away from, I mean, keep the bike path, but push the lake away from the bike path and Lakeshore Drive. But my fear, of course, is that these carvings will all be uh, as they were at other parts of the lakefront when they were rebuilt, torn up, and sent to the crusher. Now, I will say that I was able to do a, a presentation to Army Corps and city officials a few weeks ago to talk about the carvings at Morgan Shoal. So at least they're aware of them, because one reason they were torn up and sent to the crusher and these other locations is no one knew they were there. You know, the Army Corps didn't, the, the guys doing the work didn't, and so they were just ignored and destroyed. So the hope is at Morgan Shoal that they can pull some out from, from where they are and repurpose them, whether as seating, um, as ornaments, whatever. That, that's my hope. So we shall see. Um, whoops, there, whoops, hit the wrong button. Just give me a second here. Uh, oh, the other way, the other way. All right, where the heck is my cursor? If anyone sees it, let me know. There it is. Okay, sorry about that. Play. You don't need that. Okay, so Promontory Point, which is just south of Morgan Show, this is the one that's across from Museum of Science and Industry, has also been threatened. In the early 2000s, the Army Corps and the city wanted to rip out all that limestone that you see there and place it with concrete and steel. But the preservationists in Hyde Park mobilized. <laughs> Um, got the support of their elected officials, which at the time included Jesse Jackson Jr. and more significantly Barack, Senator Barack Obama. And they got between Jackson and Obama, they got the funding pulled for that part of the project. So it was never completed. The revetment survived to this day. Now the good news is that the beautiful carvings at Promontory Point, like this one, which is a fleur de lis and a couple of oak leaves, or this one, which is more funny than beautiful. It says, here Adolf lies as usual, and then someone added, and Vamp 79th Street. Um, on top of Adolf, it is right on top of that same rock, it says, this is Susie's tomb. And you can see her head and her feet at the bottom. So the good news is that the City Landmarks Commission has recommended landmark status for Promontory Point, and it's expected that the City Council will approve it this month. However, the preservationists are afraid that what they consider landmark status is not the same as what the people at the City Department of Transportation and the Park District consider landmark status. So there's still a fear that the revetments are threatened. These are also carvings from Promontory Point. The one on the left, I learned from giving a walking tour and I confirmed it, it is a crest that's on the Serbian flag. And the one on the right, 
for those of you who don't follow them, is the logo for Blue Oyster Cult, which for years I didn't know. Again, someone pointed that out to me. Um, in 2018, someone did these beautiful mosaics. Again, all a promontory point. Um, uh, but long before that, on the other side of promontory point, someone did Bathing Beauty. So this is kind of a Betty Grable-ish looking figure. Um, you know, there used to be a missile base uh, on, on the west side of um, Lakeshore Drive and then a radar station on Promontory Point in the 40s and 50s and 60s, which is, I suspect, those guys may be the ones who did these carvings. This beautiful carving, two bathing beauties wearing sun hats, sitting back to back. Sadly, over the course of um, a couple, the winter a couple of years ago, you can see right on the lake front, it's now that rock that's sitting in the lake. And so now you have to swim up to see this because it's no longer visible because it's fallen into the lake. Um, so Promontory Point needs work, everyone agrees. It's just the kind of work that's going to be done there. You know, and we're almost, we're almost done with the south side. We're almost done with the presentation. So behind La Rabita Hospital, which is 65th, the Children's Hospital, 65th Street in the lake, there's a really dense concentration of carvings. I showed you the, the, the two hearts on the right, which are next to one of my favorite of all the rock carvings, which is what I call the peace rock, which if you look at this, so you have a peace symbol, centerpiece, peace sign on the right, peace written above there. You have flowers on the upper right. On the left is the butterfly, and then my favorite part of it on the upper left is a footprint. So to me, this is like the summer of love, 1967 represented in one rock behind La Rabita Hospital. Um, you know, more hearts, Al loves Clara, 1967, with an arrow going through it. I love Doc in Georgia, 74. Um, this beautiful compass with north, south, you see there's the S, the N, north, south, east, and west. Bunch of carvings around it. Sadly, there's the compass close up. Um, falling into the lake. It used to be horizontal, it's now almost vertical. So things are a mess there, um, and it needs work if any of these carvings are to be saved. Um, and the Army Corps actually is studying La Robita for repairs in the coming years, and I've again brought this to their attention that there are a bunch of carvings there. Out in the lake, south of La, just south of La Robita, there's this amazing carving that has 12 panels in it, it was completed between the late 40s, early 50s. Here's my friend Steve looking at it out in the lake. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, each panel is its own carving and close up. So you can see there's a, there's a seahorse, there's a horseshoe with some stars, there's like some kind of weird crayfish creature on the lower right, and, you know, a, a four-leaf clover or a shamrock. So it's just this amazing carving anonymously done, one of, one of the most elaborate of all the surviving carvings, um, and it's just sitting out of the lake in the water. Um, as I said, many carvings are gone. These are examples, the caveman, um, the, the Swiss cross, the bathing beauty on the lower left. Some of these were by Helmut, who did like Montrose Man, which is that face on the second from upper right, was a Helmut carving in Montrose Harbor all gone. These are from that same vicinity. You have this very old carving based on the style of the woman on the left and then a much more recent carving on the right, but all hauled away and destroyed. A couple more bathing beauties. The most anatomically explicit of all the bathing beauties. Um, I love the fact that they created a frame for her, um, but that one's gone. Um, give you an idea of the scale of some of these carvings. This profile is gone. Um, this was a very large carving. I call this a Montrose Giant. You can also see just how deteriorated that section of shoreline was. Um, you can see those wooden pilings and how rotted they were. But this was the Montrose Giant. What I like about it is someone was too ambitious. They carved and then gave up. But then you can kind of see someone then painted. There you can see a big hand on the lower left. And if you look on the sort of center bottom, you can see feet that someone added to complete the the figure there. Um, those are gone, but there's a living tradition. So these carvings were made last, sum last summer in May and October of Promontory Point. So you have this beautiful flower. 
these were made these were made just by people who showed up. Um, the rat uh, on a bicycle raised at the point and some hands. Um, these are not a promontory point. The violin is at Diversity Harbor. And then um, this is Monty and Rose, the piping plovers, overlooking their nesting area. This was actually made by uh, Don DeSanti, who I uh, will come back to in a minute. Um, he designed the book that I worked on with my friend Aaron Packer and published in 2021, which is, tells the story that I basically have shared tonight, um, Lakefront Anonymous. If you go to lakefrontanonymous.com, you could certainly purchase the book um, if you're interested. Uh, I added my own carving um, <laughs> at Promontory Point last year, so well, that's me with my wife and my daughter, 2022. But thank you all for your time and attention. Happy if there are any take any questions if there are any. I I have a question. Um Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes. Has a break front up so that the water that hits there hits the break front before it hits the rocks on the shore. I mean I don't see a lot of deterioration, and I know that's fairly new, a lot of that stuff, yeah. but I don't see a lot of deterioration because the, the, the uh, waves are actually hitting the break. Yeah, which is why, by the way, that Calumet Park at the Indiana State Line, the, the revetments there are in very good condition because there's also a break water that U.S. Steel built that protects it. But as far as I know, there are no Milwaukee does not have carvings like this. Um, I haven't looked personally, but I've asked. I've looked around in Sheboygan, which is right on the water, and you know, you know Kenosha. The other like thing this. is, is what they're talking about when they talk about steel and concrete. All right, they share Lake Michigan. Illinois shares Lake Michigan with other states. Isn't or is that? those items, the, the what makes up concrete and steel, polluting the lake? Well, probably, I mean, the work that they do certainly stirs up stuff. Um, I don't know that the concrete and steel itself is polluting. However, there's an argument to be made, and the promontory point people make the argument that preserving the limestone is a less expensive option, both in terms of dollars, but also embedded carbon. Because making the concrete and steel requires a lot of energy. Um, so in that sense, it's more polluting than, and again, the argument is it's more polluting than doing a preservation of the structures that are already there, which is the argument that preservationists of all kinds now make for reusing old buildings rather than tearing them down and replacing them because of this embedded carbon issue. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so I'll move from you. So they use a hammer and chisel, right? But it's all different sizes of hammers and chisels, because I think in the Southwest, where I've seen many, many pictures, they just use good old-fashioned rock. Well, so, yeah. yes. So, so some people and the more accomplished carvers undoubtedly use hammers and chisels, but I think some of these carvings, and I, you know, this presentation is biased toward the more elaborate carvings, but you will see a lot of initials that someone probably just used a nail or maybe even a key to scrap. You know, you'll see carvings that are just, aren't that deep, that are just scratched into the rock. I think those people just use a key or a nail or, or another rock that they found. But to get, and I'll tell you, Roman Via Real has many, many different chisels for different purposes. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you want to have the, it, it's easier to do it if you have the right kind of chisel. You can do it with anything, but it makes it easier and faster. And, you know, by the way, like those, I showed the Save the Point carving by Roman. I mean, that took him like three hours. Even though it's a pretty elaborate carving, he was able to do that in just a few hours. Even the carving I made took me probably an hour. So, so it does not take that long to do simple carvings. The mermaid took them a week um, to carve, but it, it, um, 
it varies. Two other things I should, one other thing I should mention, because it's probably on your minds, because everyone asks is, don't the police stop people from doing this? And as far as I know, the answer is no, and has been no forever. They didn't stop Roman and his friends, even though they saw them working there. Um, in today's world, the only time I ever see police at the beach was during the COVID lockdown when they shut down the beaches and the police just went there to say, get off the beach. Um, I think if, if a cop saw you going out there with, can with spray cans, they might stop you, but they don't really care about the caravan as far as I know. And like I said, promontory point, you know, there were, there were like 20, 25 new carvings that were made last year and, you know, there was no interference with that, so um, I don't think the police really care. When the police saw Bob Nachtrieb and Cliff Weaver at 4 a.m. in 1964 <laughs> walking with a bag, that they stopped them and kind of said, what are you doing? And they, they explained what they actually told them, the cop, what they were doing. And I guess the cop was something like, okay, you knuckleheads, <laughs> you know, go ahead. So. Um, you mentioned um, Indiana as far as where, and I'm going to call them rocks, <laughs> all right? But I was fortunate enough a couple of years ago to go, go down by the University of Indiana. And in July, they have a carver's meet down there for a whole month. And people come from all over. And you get to see the different tools they use, whether some of it was electric and some of it was hand done, but it's all different kinds of carving out of the big, huge um, boulders. Yeah, I would love to, to I, it's on my list of things to do. <laughs> yeah. There's, there, there's some footage online, there are some documentaries as well as vintage footage um, about the, the quarries there, and they talk to a lot of these stone carvers who are really accomplished, who, you know, when you see the, the elaborate stone carvings on buildings from these quarries, like the Empire State Building and some of the Chicago, I think Union Station was, was from there, you know, these were done by these amazing stone carvings who work, carvers who work at these quarries, and, and they even, ship them up. Yeah, even if you go through the neighborhood, uh, uh, some of the people buy the carvings that are done by the people for that month. It's, it's yeah. gorgeous. It's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Just don't go there. Just don't visit the quarries by yourself and don't go swimming in them because they are <laughs> dangerous places. Uh, I've been told by people who've uh, visited them. Any other questions or comments? Yes. How did you get interested in this, and how much time did it take you to take all these pictures and write all this history? So, so I have a long-standing interest in art by artists who were not trained, um, going back to the 1980s. Um, so offside call, whether it's called folk art or outsider art or self-taught art. Um, and, and so my friend Aaron Packer, who I wrote the book with, um, he had discovered he had noticed these carvings in the late 1980s, bicycling up and down the lake and started documenting them. And when I befriended Aaron, probably in the early 1990s, he told me about them. And I went out and looked at them and thought these were great, but I didn't really think twice about it because I didn't live nearby the lake at that time. Um, later on, I, we moved to within a half a mile of Foster Avenue Beach and I started really noticing the carvings then and started taking, sort of casually taking photos, but this is pre-digital camera. So, you know, one did not, uh, did, one, one was a little more uh, scrupulous about photographing them. Unfortunately, I didn't really realize the extent of the carvings or how vulnerable they were until after the Army Corps project had really ripped many of them out. And, but because of that project, I realized I better find out where these carvings are and someone needs to document them. And because hardly anyone knew about them, except me and Aaron and a handful of other people, and no one had written about them other than that mermaid and, and a couple of passing references, um, I started probably in 2014, 2012, really trying to systematically photograph them. So I spent several years 
doing this, um, I couldn't tell you how many hours I spent photographing them, editing the photos, annotating the photos, and then writing. I spent most of 2020 and 2021 really preparing the book. Um, and then once it came out in the fall of 2021, I spent a fair amount of time giving talks like this and trying to promote it a little bit. But it's not so much about the book as the awareness of the carvings themselves, so that, so that the rest of them don't meet the same fate as the ones that were lost. Anything else? I guess we're right on, pretty much on time. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it.